On Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, I'm Amy Goodman with Aaron Matte. Well, we turn now to Israel and the occupied territories. On Monday, the Israeli government made a rare appearance before the UN Human Rights Committee. Each member state is reviewed every four years for its compliance with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. That task was especially significant coming just weeks after Israel ended an assault on Gaza that killed nearly 2,200 Palestinians, including more than 500 children. Emmy Palmore, the director general of Israel's Justice Ministry, pledged her government's sincere approach to the panel's mandate. We decided to bring along the highest ranking uh, experts on the issues that we are supposed to answer. And indeed, you can see that for the first time, the director general, myself, is heading uh, the delegation. The deputy uh, attorney general, Dr. Shendorf, is uh, uh, second on the delegation, and the others, as were presented during the session. And uh, we believe that this shows our seriousness, the, the sincere um, approach of Israel to these issues. That's Emmy Paul Moore, head of the Israeli delegation to the U.N. Human Rights Committee. But as the session got underway, a key problem emerged. Israel would not be answering for conditions in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, the territory it's occupied for nearly half a century. While Israel provided a written report for human rights within its own borders, it did not agree that co the covenant applies to its actions in the occupied territories. In response, two U.N. panelists expressed their frustration. We have that information about the doubling, the recent announ announcement in Israel of further expansion of the settlements uh, in uh, the occupied Palestinian territories and in uh, East Jer Jerusalem. So that was the reason that I raised the question. Uh, it seemed that no attention had been given whatsoever to our earlier recommendation. Of course, they're not responsible for the violations that may be committed by Hamas. Of course they're not. But they are responsible for any violations that may be their own responsibility. It's not an issue of legal jurisdiction one way or the other. It's an issue of who has control. That's Nigel Rodley from Britain, and before that, Cornelius Flinterman. As it turned out, the assault on Gaza did not receive the scrutiny that had been expected. As the Jerusalem Post reported at day's end, Israel's Emmy Palmore, quote, said she was relieved that the delegation had not been extensively quizzed about the IDF's military actions in Gaza this summer under Operation Protective Edge. Israel had imagined that committee members would focus on that issue, the Jerusalem Post said. Uh, well, we're still joined by legal experts expert who's just spent six years trying to hold Israel to account for its actions in the occupied territories. Richard Falk has just completed his term as Special Rapporteur on Palestinian Human Rights for the United Nations Human Rights Council. His writings about the Israel-Palestine issue and his experience as U.N. Rapporteur are compiled in a new book. It's out today. It's called Palestine, The Legitimacy of Hope. Richard Falk is professor emeritus of international law at Princeton University and research professor in the Global Studies Department at UC Santa Barbara. He presented the Edward Said Memorial Lecture last night at Columbia University. Can you talk about, well, just that, this latest news on um, uh, what is happening right now with Israel and Gaza? Well, as far as uh, their cooperation with the U.N. is concerned, this uh, r report that you just uh, showed your audience uh, is very misleading. They have refused to cooperate with the Commission of Inquiry in that the Human Rights Council appointed to look into the allegations of war crimes associated with the attack on Gaza in July and August. And they refused to co uh, cooperate with my successor, uh, an Indonesian diplomat who they favored, actually. And they persuaded the president of the Human Rights Council to appoint with the expectation that they would cooperate with him. But as I've said all along, you only have to be 10 percent objective to come to the same critical conclusions that I came to in relation to Israel's violation of fundamental human rights in the West Bank, East Jerusalem and uh, Gaza, the three segments of occupied territory. What is that conclusion that you came to? Well, the conclusion is uh, flagrant uh, violations 
that are official policy. It's not deviations from the extension of the settlements as a violation of international humanitarian law, not disallowing transfer of the occupying country's population to the occupied society, the imposition of a regime of collective punishment on the whole civilian population of Gaza, and locking that civilian population into the combat zone during protective edge is a distinctive atrocity, where women and children were not allowed to become refugees, or and there was no opportunity to be an internally displaced person. As horrible as things were for civilians in Syria and in Iraq in recent years, they always had—the civilian population always could leave the combat zone. Here, they're literally locked in to the combat zone, and only those Gazans with foreign passports were allowed to leave. That involved 800 people out of 1,800,000. So it's a—it is a very extreme situation that is not treated as a human ongoing humanitarian catastrophe for geopolitical reasons. The U.S. has a geopolitical veto over what the U.N. can do in relation to a situation of this kind. We react to Kabani, as we spoke earlier, but we ignore what is happening day by day in Gaza particularly, but to a lesser extent in the West Bank. Well, you mentioned the U.S. Can you talk about the obstacles that you face as you tried to raise these issues over these past six years as the top U.N. investigator in the territories? Well, there were uh, two main kinds of obstacles. The, uh, I was uh, very much uh, attacked in a kind of defamatory way by U.N. Watch and other very uh, extreme uh, Zionist uh, organizations. Which try wherever I went, anywhere in the world, they would try to prevent me from speaking and uh, mounted a kind of uh, defamatory campaign, called me a anti-Semite, a leading anti-Semite. The Wiesenthal Center in L.A. listed me as the third most dangerous anti-Semite in the world, which was made me feel I must be doing something right in this role. And the only two people that were more dangerous than I was the supreme leader of Iran and uh, the prime minister of Turkey, Erdogan. And, uh, U.S. Other... Ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power, uh, ca called you as you were leaving your U.N. post a relent—said, um, uh, talked about your relentless anti-Israeli bias. Well, it's, it certainly has been a consistent anti-Israeli uh, critical uh, narrative, because that's what the reality is. I mean, if you take international law seriously, and as I said, if you're 10 percent objective, you have to come to these conclusions. And that's why this Indonesian, who was determined uh, to please Israel, he told me that, uh, uh, it turned out that Macarim they were— Macarim Wibasono. Yes. Uh, it, it turned out he, he's already angered Israel. Uh, because you can't, uh, you can't look at these uh, realities without coming to these conclusions, unless you're completely uh, somehow uh, blindfold yourself. Well, let's talk about what Palestinians are trying to do now, the, the Palestinian Authority, at least. The PA has drafted a U.N. Security Council measure that would impose a three-year deadline for Israel to end the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Speaking at the U.N. last month, Palestinian lawmaker Hanan Ashrari dismissed the threat of losing U.S. government support. We will be seeking a Security Council resolution uh, on ending the occupation within that specified date. And any solution must be based on international law, cannot violate international law and UN conventions and agreements. If the U.S. wants to isolate itself as a reaction to Palestinians joining the international community, then that, uh, they're welcome to do that. Uh, our, the American funding is not uh, that essential to, to Palestinian survival. Quite often, joining the international community, having the protection of the law and so on, is much more important than uh, 
getting some funding from Congress that is conditional. Hanan Ashari went on to say, quote, enough is enough. What has the U.S. done for us? And, in fact, there was a report last week uh, that Secretary of State John Kerry has asked the PA to delay its uh, U.N. Security Council bid uh, uh, measure here, proposal, until after the midterm elections. Is the PA actually distancing itself from this whole U.S. process, and is that important? Well, it's caught between the militancy of its own people and this kind of pragmatic adaptation to the power situation and, and, the, uh, and its economic dependence on funding that is uh, controlled uh, by Israel and the U.S. And also its security forces have been—the PA security forces have been trained under U.S. authority. So it's a—they're in a very compromised position. So the Palestinian— uh, authority leadership in order to retain some modicum of legitimacy has to appear to be reflecting the will of the Palestinian people. And they have been trying to walk this tightrope uh, all along, and it becomes more and more difficult. And the, the recent polls show that Hamas, even on the West Bank, would now win an election if an election was held. And that's not because there's a shift toward an Islamic orientation. It's because Hamas, for all its problems and failures, resists and is resilient and has maintained the spirit of resistance that's so important to the political morale of the Palestinian movement. On the issue of resistance, uh, you talked last night about the importance of defending the right to resist, but advocating uh, peaceful resistance. Can you talk more about this, for the, uh, yeah. vis-a-vis the Palestinian struggle? Well, I, I, I don't uh, purport to speak for the Palestinians. And one of the tragedies of the Palestinians uh, ever since the Balfour Declaration is that others have decided what's good for Palestine. and. So what I was—I was partly being descriptive. This, the Palestinians have failed with armed struggle. They failed with the Arab neighbors trying to liberate uh, Palestine from uh, Israeli control. They failed with the Oslo-type intergovernmental diplomacy. So what they've tried in the last several years, increasingly, is a combination of nonviolent resistance in various forms within the occupied territory and this growing uh, global solidarity movement that uh, has centered on the BDS campaign. I think that's — and I, I don't say uh, I wouldn't judge their desire to, or their, their feeling that the only effective form of resistance is to uh, defend themselves violently. I mean, that's, that's a decision that I don't think it's appropriate for someone outside the context of oppression to make. Hamas, which is accused of being a terrorist organization, of course, uh, has limited its violence since its political election in 2006 to responding uh, to uh, Israeli provocations. It hasn't used violence as a way of uh, promoting uh, the empowerment of a Palestinian movement of liberation. In fact, its, its politics have been directed toward long-term peaceful coexistence with Israel uh, if Israel withdraws to the 67 borders. It's offered a 50-year uh, uh, plan of peaceful coexistence. We're going to end where you begin, and that's the title of your book, Palestine, the Legitimacy of Hope, Richard Falk. What do you mean by the legitimacy of hope? What I mean is that if you look at the way in which conflicts have been resolved since the end of World War II, particularly involving uh, foreign domination or foreign rule in a third world country, the decisive uh, factor in their resolution has been 
gaining the high ground of international morality and international law, that, and not having military superiority has not produced political outcomes favorable to the intervening or the more powerful side. And so the hope comes from this pattern of legi gaining legitimacy in what I call legitimacy war being more significant politically than being able to control the results on a battlefield. And that's a profound change in the whole structure of power in the world that hasn't been absorbed by either Israel or the United States. Richard Falk, we want to thank you for being with us. Just completed a six-year term as United Nations Special Rapporteur on Palestinian Human Rights, a prolific writer. His book, Palestine, The Legitimacy of Hope, has just been published today. Professor Emeritus of International Law, Princeton University, and research professor in the Global Studies Department at UC Santa Barbara. He presented the Edward Said Memorial Lecture last night at Columbia University. This